Hi.
and wanting to give their blessing, and they want to give their welcoming to you. The many nations that set foot on this land represent a crossroads of people, of different knowledges and different wisdom, very much emulating the conference itself as it welcomes visitors and guests from throughout the known world. We're at a crossroads now with this theme. We want to get back. So remember, one finger is just missing. Don't do anything. Try to be emotional. Stop. Reflection. Meditate. On the second one, I want you to quietly and softly follow the peace that I'll have. On the third one, I want you to start humming, giving life and breath to this blessing. And when I'm holding four fingers up, I want you to start singing. And then we're going to go through it three more times. And on the fourth one, I'm going to raise my hand and we all stand. Are you ready? It was not a test, it was to give a better direction. <laughs> oh, 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 oh,
hands together on that fourth one when I raise up my hand, we're all going to stand. Are you ready? You'll get it. Welcome. I'm John Bonine, a Professor of Environmental Law at the University of Oregon. Welcome to the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. This is not a University of Oregon conference. This is not a law school event. This is a student organized conference which always has been and always will be organized by the students, the law students of the University of Oregon. So let's start by giving them our thanks. More than three decades ago, before many in this room were, I guess, even born, environmental activists who happened to be law students in this university, along with a couple of young environmental law professors, who are also lawyers who took cases to court, discussed the need to broaden and deepen the movement for public interest environmental law. They decided together, the students and the young professors, to have a conference. 75 people came. And so the next year, the law students decided to do it again. The participation increased. The numbers grew. But there were problems. And the problems led to protests. Why were the speakers mostly men? A group of women demanded to know. Are you building an environmental law movement for just half of society? The conference changed as a result of that protest, and it grew. The conference celebrated the year of the indigenous people, but the organizers forgot to include indigenous people in the planning. A large protest erupted on campus. People paraded. 
And the conference learned its lesson, and it changed, and it grew some more. The conference was prob uh, primarily an event of people from the United States. But then it started to include lawyers and activists from other countries around the world. It became international, and it grew. The conference had focused primarily on the concerns of middle-class white lawyers and activists and students. But one year, a caucus took place, some protests took place. Among attendees, they got together, and environmental justice came to the forefront then and for the rest of the years of the conference until now. The conference has always had radical activists. There was a time when some of them were driving metal spikes into old trees in an attempt to save those trees from being cut down by loggers. But when the trees were cut and the spikes were in them, they were sent to sawmills, and sometimes those metal spikes flew out and injured and had the potential of even killing a worker. The visionaries in the Earth First movement decided that we needed to be allies, not enemies, with labor. They announced the abandonment of tree spiking, leading to the inclusion of blue collars along with the green dreadlocks. Julia Butterfly Hill lived for more than two years in the top of a giant redwood tree in California, 1,500 years old. One year, she was a keynote speaker at this conference by cell phone from the top of the tree. She eventually came down. An agreement was organized, a complex agreement involving the saving of that tree. But there were those who thought that she sold out. And they came here to protest. Protest is part of the heritage of this conference. But tolerance is also part of our heritage. Every year, the conference needs to learn something in its soul that it previously knew only in its head. Every year, the conference and its participants have to learn to let go of their prejudices, to let go of their past, to let go of their exclusiveness. This conference is an inclusive one. Every year, the conference and its participants, and yes, the speakers and keynoters, have something new to learn. We don't become stronger through exclusion, but through inclusion and through be willing, being willing to change because of new insights. Every year, we need to learn just how deep and how green our resistance needs to become, how far we have to go, and what we need to do to get there. Every year, every year we also need to learn just how broad our movement needs to become. Our movement to save this planet must be white, and black, and yellow, and brown, and red, and deep green. And joyful, and gay, and straight, and bi, and transgender, and queer. It must abandon patriarchy, and it must resist. But that resistance must also be against any other substitute archies that also exclude others who are working to protect this planet. Every kind of person in this movement is needed to save our planet. Every hue of the glorious rainbow of people that make up this world. Every year we also have to learn how vigilantly we must act to protect our freedom to speak out. The speech freedom of those who protest and the speech freedom of those who lecture. So I ask you in the audience to open your hearts, and I ask you who speak to us from the podiums or in the classrooms to open your hearts and to listen. Our movement will grow if we actually listen to each other. One person who cannot listen, who can never listen again, who is not here at the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference, is a giant. His name was Tim Lillibo. Tim Lillibo was a giant in the Oregon 
environmental and conservation movement. He was an East Sider, a sort of cowboy in his appearance and demeanor. His hat, you know, I think his hat had never been washed in its life. Sadly, Tim died this month, too young, too early. Tim played crucial roles in saving several areas in Oregon from destruction. These Oregon wilderness areas would not be safely on the map if it weren't for Tim Lillibo, Wanaha Tekanan, Black Canyon, Bridge Creek, Mill Creek, Monument Rock, North Fork John Day Wilderness, North Fork Umatilla Wilderness, and significant expansions of the Eagle Cap, Hell's Canyon, Strawberry Mountain Wildernesses. Tim isn't here to talk to us, but please join me in the only way that we wilderness lovers know how to talk to him wherever he is. Tim, here are mournful howls. <laughs> I declare this 32nd annual Public Interest Environmental Law Conference to be open. Good evening and welcome to the 2014 Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. This year, our conference theme is Running Into Running Out. Running Into Running Out recognizes that we are aggressively changing the natural world with little regard for the future. Our best scientists warn that continuing on this business as usual trajectory will place our world amidst unpredictable and irreversible planetary catastrophe. These are the facts we face. We are running out of time, we are running out of options, but we have not run out yet. Over the next three days, you will have the opportunity to hear keynote addresses from experts in environmental law, climate science, activism, indigenous issues, and human rights. You will also have the opportunity, or rather the challenge, to choose from over 130 panels that have been assembled here this weekend. Each keynoter and panelist brings a unique perspective. And although we may not always agree, the human energy produced by the conversation that follows is, ex is exactly the impetus that we need to overcome our situation of running in to running out. We hope that this energy will galvanize the environmental movement and inspire new solutions to old problems. This year, we received a letter from Abraham. He is nine years old. He is already concerned about the fate of our environment and the species who inhabit, who call it home. He drew a picture showing the numbers of remaining several species that inhabit the land, the air, and the water. He drew a California condor, estimated population 200. Next to that, he drew a Panamanian golden frog, population in the wild 25. The last was the beji. The beji is extinct. It's clear the message Abraham is sending. We better do something now or the California condor, the Panamanian golden frog, and thousands of others will end up just like the Beji. In the midst of a mass extinction unprecedented since the time of the dinosaurs, we have an obligation to change our course. For me, for you, and for Abraham, we have to change our course. But change is always difficult. We cannot allow this difficulty to get in the way of taking action. The most urgent moments in history always inspire spirited debate, but we do not have the time to wait. The facts beg for a long, sober assessment of the race we've been running. The situation is dire, but we can't give in. We must press forward. It is easy to talk about pressing forward to save the planet, but we must consider the fine details of that effort, 
Throughout the conference, we challenge you to consider the complex dimensions of change. How can we retain the progress that we have made while discarding the practices that threaten life as we know it? We know that we cannot mortgage the future for the benefit of our species alone. We know that anthro arrogance is not an option and that we are just one part of a complex system that depends on diversity. Yet we also know that some of the conflicts and divides that characterized our past are fading away. Opportunities for progress and new solutions are emerging. We encourage you to empower these solutions by actively engaging with the diverse ideas and individuals that have gathered for Pilk. We all have something to contribute as well as something to learn. The purpose of this conference is to facilitate learning and understanding. But this knowledge is meant for more than just for learning. This knowledge creates a duty to act. For, for far too often, people are able to recognize problems, but they never work towards a solution. The expectation is that the knowledge gained here will go into practice to work in the present for the future health of our environment. This conference expects action. The planet expects action. We're at a special moment in history. We're running towards a tipping point, and we have an opportunity to act in a way that past generations could not. But we also need to take advantage of this opportunity and act as past generations could not. If our collective knowledge is put into action, we can ensure that a better, more just, and a sustainable future is available for cur current and future generations of all species. So it's great to see such a full room. Let me just say that. Take, it, take the somber notch down a little bit. Um, so the issues we've been talking about are global, right? This is a global problem, and it demands global solutions. And uh, we're really blessed at this conference almost every year to have a great international perspective. And the next two speakers that are going to come up here and speak uh, offer that perspective. Uh, it's two scholars. They're eminent in their field. And the first one that you're going to hear from is Dr. Wayne T. Jung. Now, Dr. Wen, he's a professor of... Um, Basically, world reconstruction, development, he holds a number of titles at Renmin University in Beijing, China. He's an extraordinarily distinguished scholar, and we're, actually, we're absolutely honored to have him here this year. Following uh, Dr. Wen, you'll hear from Dr. Wang. Dr. Wang is a professor at Claremont. He's also the uh, director for the Institute of Postmodern Development of China. Uh, now Dr. Wang is definitely no stranger to conferences. He's organized over 70 conferences promoting ecological development, um, sustainable agriculture, and the like. Um, but before you hear from those two speakers, you're going to hear from one of University of Oregon's own, and also one of my favorite scholars, Dr. John Bellamy Foster. Dr. Foster is the editor of the Monthly Review, which is the nation's longest-running socialist publication. It's been running since 1949. Um, he's published a number of books. My favorite is Marx's Ecology. I definitely suggest you read it. Um, and he's going to help facilitate the conversation between Dr. Wen and Dr. Wong. So without further ado, uh, please welcome these scholars to the stage. We'll get chairs. We'll get chairs. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm going to make some brief remarks uh, simply because we have uh, distinguished visitors from China uh, to speak on the, on the environment, and this is a, a very unique experience for the University of Oregon, I dare say for, for the United States itself. Uh, we often talk about uh, China and the environment now, and we, we mostly look at China as a problem. I think that our, our dominant discourse is one of, of China as a problem. What, what's going to happen if China keeps on growing? What if China keeps on burning so much coal? Uh, what about uh, the billion people in China and so on? And of course, it's, uh, what about uh, uh, everyone in China uh, having, 
having a, a car, driving a car. And naturally, uh, this is a concern because the planet is limited and, uh, and we have to be concerned about every country in the world and its effects on the environment. And China now, of course, is, has uh, an incredible effect. And we also talk sometimes about China's technology and we talk about maybe China is the hope in terms of ecological modernization. Maybe China is the, the, the hope in terms of, of uh, controlling uh, carbon dioxide emissions and so on. This isn't very convincing to most environmentalists. Uh, it's also very worrisome because most of us know that it isn't just a technological problem and we have to deal with issues of economic growth and society. But when you're talking about a country like China that's growing at 7 to 7% 7 a year or even 10% a year, obviously that raises issues. These are the things we hear, these are the things we talk about, and sometimes it makes us more pessimistic than before. But I wanted uh, to uh, introduce these speakers by saying they bring us a lot of hope. Because what we don't hear about in, in the United States is that uh, China has been discussing ecological civilization. We don't uh, hear about the, the uh, vital discussions of ecological Marxism in China. Ideas that started in the West but have been embraced in China and uh, are, are engaging all sorts of, of, uh, of people in universities and movements uh, everywhere. We don't hear about the massive protests. We don't hear about what uh, uh, Professor Wong is going to talk about in terms of uh, uh, constructive postmodernism in China. We don't hear about the rural reform movement of which uh, uh, Dr. Wen is the principal uh, leader. Uh, we don't know that, that figures like uh, John Cobb, who writes with, with uh, Herman Daly, is uh, very much connected with the, the uh, constructive postmodernist ecology movement in China. We don't hear about these things, these, these incredible, vital, critical discussions that in some ways go beyond our own. And uh, I want to introduce these speakers simply with that note. Uh, they bring us hope because we're not the only ones fighting this battle. And if our media doesn't tell us about what is going on in China, then we have to bring uh, the leading Chinese spokespeople uh, to here to this environmental law conference to tell us themselves. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good evening, everybody here. And uh, just now, uh, I was entitled as a kind of social movement leader. But in China, we have a different culture. I never think that I'm leader. I'm just a resource person. I facilitate the social work. That's it. So, and uh, in China, we have uh, so many social movements and the social networks, but few people can stand out to say that I'm the leader. So that is different culture. I hope you understand. It's a, in Oriental, there's another history and another culture. And if such kind of conference uh, host in, in China, I just uh, can stay at the corner and then hear others. Uh, here, I was uh, here to tell you something about China. I first want to say that you can have a lot of information about China's threat. Or oh, maybe some months later, you can have another, another uh, uh, media talking about China collapse. So sometimes collapse, sometimes threats. Maybe confused. But let me tell you the, the truth in China, what happened. The first, and the curve shows that there are a cyclical economic crisis. 
I suppose the cyclical crisis is very popular in political economics theory. Everybody understands that, maybe. Uh, but few people know that almost every Chinese leader, when they take the power, they first need to facing the challenge of the economic crisis. Deng Xiaoping took power in 1978. And then what he but he have to he has to deal with that is a forty million people with no job. At that time the statistic didn't calculate them into the unemployment. We said that's the waiting job use. Our generation nowadays became older, but in the beginning of the nineteen eighties we are the waiting job use means that we have no job. Not only jobless, but also homeless and securityless. That is a Deng Xiaoping facing the main challenge. 40 million young people, no job. And then I should ask you, if there is 40 million young people, no job, what will happen in the United States? And that is a uh, Deng started his readjustment in the macro policy in name of economic reform. So here that foreign media talk a lot about China marketization and China going to privatization and uh, that is market oriented reform, whatever. But indeed is that that time the central governments led by Deng Xiaoping need to deal with very, very bad depression. That is the economic crisis. Caused by what? By the 1970s, China took large amount of foreign investments from Western countries. You may know that China regained the diplomatic relationship with the United States and other Western countries in the year 1971 to 1972, and the American government, Nixon, at that time, announced, released control. Originally, American controlled uh, all the foreign trade and stopped China to have a foreign trade. That is like Cuba, like North Korea. That is 1970s. When American president think that they need to rebuild up the relation with China, so they released the control. No barrel that time. So China started to have a foreign trade and then to take foreign investments from the beginning of the 1970s, just uh, 10 years. Very big deficit because the foreign debts turned to the budget deficit and then budget cannot reinvestments for the industries and then large amount of young people have no job. That is an economic crisis caused by foreign debts. That is the 1970s. Every developing countries, the first problem is not isms, not ideology, not whatever you believe, that is another thing. But the, the true things is that extremely shortage of the capital investments. That is a very popular in developing countries, not like developed country. You have an advantage, you have a capital surplus. But in developing country, it's a capital shortage. No capital investments, no industry. And then no employment, and nothing. Okay, so that is why 1970s, China absorbed large amount of foreign investment, and then immediately turned to the foreign debts. And debts turned to the government's budget deficit. And then, so the problem happened. That is a Deng Xiaoping need to solve the problem. That is a so-called economic reform. Okay, understand me? Yeah, and when he tried to push China going to the market, market reform, another problem happened. Originally, you have a so-called planning system, and then there's no inflation. When you just joined its market system, immediately you you are, you are facing the challenge of high inflation. So here you can see the second one. Premier Zhao Ziyang 
nowadays in name of a kind of economic reformer. He is a premier. He pushed the reform. But when he took the power as the central party leader, the key issue is high inflation. You know, CPI, 18.6%. You cannot imagine, because here in the United States, your CPI, the whole country, less than two points, two percent. But in 1980s, late 1980s, in China, 18.6. In most of these developing countries, when they just uh, try to set up the market system, they have the same problem. So China have the problem in the late 1988, and then turn to the depression, 1990s, uh, 1989, and then turn to the social protest, and then turn to the political issue. That is a Tiananmen political movements in, 19, in, 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 eight, in 1989. But they cannot solve the problem like a lot of uh, uh, transition countries. Even they have a political movement. People go to the street, go to the square. They cannot solve the economic crisis. Like Egypt, like Ukraine now, almost every country, no matter whatever they have as a political movement, economic is economy. Economic depression still be there. So the 1990, 1991, these are years is depression. So when they changed the political leader, Jiang Zemin took power in the year 1992. He first need to deal with the depression. And then 1993, when he took the power the first year, there are three deficits happened in China as a macroeconomic problem. Three deficit, first it's a budget deficit, very serious. So they got to deal with the budget problem, and then the second one is the, the bank. You may know that, you, I, think, I think that you don't know. In 1993, the whole of Chinese bank have no capital, zero. Even minus, because the government's budget deficit took the capital from the bank, even took the savings. So that means the budget is a very serious problem, and the bank also the serious problem. But China is not American system. So American, the bank go to bankrupt it. And then governments pay. But at that time, no. At that time, in 19, the beginning of the 1990s, we don't have commercial bank. Bank is just a one hand of the government's macro adjustment. So in China, in China, the governments, especially the central governments, have two hands. One is budget, another is bank. So finance still be a kind of measure to deal with the economic problem. And then third one is that the foreign trade deficit. Before 1980s, we, China don't have, didn't have so big trade, foreign trade. Until 1990s, the foreign trade increased, and then the foreign trade deficit still be increased, followed. So by three deficits, that is uh, also caused by Soviet Union collapse. There's a big impact to China, China how they choose the way. And that time I was in the United States, and a lot of people talked to me that you cannot stand three years because the iron curve has been bankrupted. Now next is China. So at that time, the beginning of 1990s, China collapse. It's a mainstream. The media talk a lot. China must be next after the Soviet Union. And also because of very serious the economic depression and the three deficits is a make China at that time cannot just, just uh, you know to choose any way to go. And then by that, it's a Jiang Zemin need to do something in 1990s. So 1990s, the economic problems much, much severe than European countries now. Also much severe than European, not than, than US now. And followed by his uh, power, his, uh, his reform, we have uh, 40, uh, 40, no, yes, 45 million 
workers lay off. But they are also not in name of unemployment. They are in name of the uh, out-of-job employment. It's a very contradiction, OK? <laughs> out-of-job means that you have no job. But you still can have a little bit of money for your family survive. Means that at that time, the governments gave the order to the bank. Bank belonged to the state. And then the bank gave the money, gave the fund to the factories. Factory gave the, the basic, not salary, the basic uh, income to every worker. And then worker, worker come back, can feed their family. But at a very low level. 45 million. It's a very big number. It's not like waiting job use. Means that use, we don't have job. We wait. But out of job employee means that you originally have job. You're working in the factory. But nowadays, every day you should go. Go to your workshop, go to your factory, and then register as that you, have, you are here, you work. But indeed, you have no job. That is a very contradiction phenomenon in 1990s. But 45 million, big enough in the world. It's almost a lot of countries' population. But they solve the problem by not market system, by non-market system. And then they passed anyway. Even many families very, very suffered. But it's a, most of these, they have a similar problem. So they passed. That is the 1990s. And then make a lot of... Uh, 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 Pricing. A lot of, a lot of uh, mass uh, people protest and so on and so That is uh, like 19th century European countries working class struggle. But we are not in name of working class. And then by after that, oh, meanwhile, a lot of rural people, I mean, marginalized the population in countryside. They also have a little cash income. So a lot of Rural people to be migrants laborers flow to the coastal area. Nowadays, increase to, you know, 269 million. Understand me? That is a almost whole American population move. Think about China. Almost 300 million people move. How much uh, bus and the trains you need? and how much pavement road you need to build up. So anyway, that happened in the 1990s. But few of foreign media gave a report. So nowadays, you only talk about communist China, socialist China, communist party, whatever, isms, whatever you talked here, it's just uh, whatever you talked. But it's not the truth. The truth is large number of workers lay off. Large number of peasants labor move out. That is uh, almost the biggest social uh, people's uh, movements in mainland China. But you, you, you just uh, have no such kind of information. So I think that I tell you the, the, the truth, and then you may have your, your, your own thought. You think of what is China. And then that is extremely difficult. And then past. How China passed is because of a, another very important economic crisis happened. That is not inside China happened, it's outside. That is East Asian countries' financial turmoil happened in 1997. Look there. It's uh, 1997, East Asian financial turmoil happened and attacked Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, even South Korea. A lot of countries' financial system collapsed. And then the whole Asian area reduced demand. So the foreign demand, overseas market demand in China also decreased. So when China just uh, half the uh, recovered, economically re recovered, and then they immediately facing the new challenge, that is a uh, foreign demand decreased. And then immediately that the whole of the Chinese industries facing the challenge as American, as European, in 1929 to 1933. You know that. 29 to 33, what happened in Western countries? 
overproduction. So when China just set up the industrial system, immediately facing the challenge of overproduction because overseas demand decreased very sharply. That is 1998. And then facing such kind of challenge, what you do, what you did in 1930s. I think that all the professors know, students need to go back to check your textbook. <laughs> you have a Roosevelt, yes? And Roosevelt policy is what? Stop market. Use government's hands to push the surplus industrial capital into the inland infrastructure construction. Sure. And then American, just a closed door. Don't make trade with Europe because Europe much much troubled than the United States. You have a big continental. You can use your surplus industrial capacity for infrastructure construction. So you survived. But European countries, no, fall into the war. So America until 1941, you join the Pacific War. Before that, no, you try to protect yourself. That is the history. I don't want to talk too much. I just summarize. And then now China facing the similar problem in the year 1998. Can China keep going on market system? At that time, I'm one of, I was one of the policy researcher in the central policy think tank. What we suggest to the central governments is that the only one policy we can learn is Roosevelt policy. Understand me? It means American in 1930s is the model we learn. That is late 1990s, just uh, 70 years past. So from that time, China start to invest by the governments. The governments try their bonds issued. Here, when you have the problem, you issue the American treasury bonds for financial capital. In China, in late 1990s, they also used the, the bonds for the investments for what? Physical production. So that is a different way. In China, it's a physical production to absorb the surplus capacity of the industry. So from that time, from the late 1990s to now, we have a 50 years large amount of investments led by so-called governments. The governments need to play a very important function and then to move this big industrial capacity into the infrastructure construction that is a from the late 1990s, China have a three major state strategy. The first, we said three rebalance. Because 1980s, 1990s, 20 years, China have a three gap. Coastal inland became big gap. No. And uh, rural urban became big gap. I mean, men, poor and rich. So we have a three gap. And from late 1990s, this three gap need to have a rebalance. So the first one is a regional gap. So China started to invest into Western China, Northeast China, and Middle China. So the total amount is a eight trillion Chinese yuan. It's almost 1.2 trillion American dollars. Exactly for the infrastructure construction. So the highway, the fast train, the airport, and the irrigation system, whatever, built up in Western China, Northeast, and Mid China, and then to make the balance of the regional gap. Yeah, they succeeded. Just uh, five or eight years ago. Nowadays, the Western China, inland China, GDP grows higher than the coastal area. And after that, China started to invest into the rural urban gap large amount of investments flow into the countryside for five communication, pavement road, electricity, pipe water, telephone, and the internet. So these are five built up into the village. Nowadays, 99% of rural households have electricity. Uh, much, much better than other developing countries. But remember, cannot take back. 
You build up the road to the countryside. Can you ask these scattered farmers' households to pay back, pay back these investments? No way. Who invest? State bank. Who carry out such kind of big project? SOE, state-owned enterprises. So that is why we said it's a Roosevelt policy. It's not others. Okay, so by these uh, uh, investments, China also set up the social umbrella for the rural people. So from 2005 until now, also eight years, China invested into countryside eight trillion Chinese yuan. It's uh, 1.2 trillion dollars. And so by these uh, two big projects, we have a uh, two balance. Regional gap, rebalance. Urban rural gap, rebalance. Now China should target the poor and rich. Poor rich gap now in, in China enlarged. Similar as the United States. You have a one percent of population occupied forty percent of the properties. China is a five percent occupied forty four percent. So similar. So the gap between rich and the poor enlarged. Now how to reduce such kind of gap? That is the new challenge. So here we can see that the so-called smiling curve. Now China, the outside of China, we got to facing the challenge of the new era of the financial capital. The financial capital era means that you are here, you are United States citizens, you know that your government did. They have a QE and super QE. QE1, QE2, QE3, QE4. And then QE means that, means that you only pay five cents at the cost and then you print 100 bill. The bill, very low cost, but very high, yeah, yeah, sure, very high returns. And then means that you transfer the cost to other countries. Not you, your government. And then, like China, the, China is at the bottom. So if China cannot build up the infrastructure for the environment, for the resources, means that China cannot change the position, always be at the bottom. So that is why now China very much emphasizes the ecological civilization. And then, invest, now they turn the investment directions going to invest into the, the reconstruction of the environment to maintain the resources. That is a big change, but they need time. As I mentioned, that the regional gap, they paid eight years. The rural urban gap, another eight years. So the environment rebalance, we need maybe 10, maybe 20 years. So not started. So and. Uh, Look at this one. The demand problem in China is very serious now. It's because of the high GDP growth. Look at this, uh, the, the, the curve. The whole world, after the Second World War, most of the developing countries, they are trying to learn the developed country. What is developed country? Industrialization. So developing countries want to set up industries for the national industrialization and then to make a lot of resources consumed by the industries, and then to make the pollution more and more serious. Not only the industry, but also the agriculture. When agriculture is trying to modernize, they use more chemicals. Not only the poisons, but also the fertilizers. They use a lot of chemicals, and then to make the agriculture area pollution become much, much severe than the industry, than the urban. So now China have a much, uh, uh, agriculture pollution. Then the, uh, here is the picture shows that the environment destroyed. And then also the drought is very serious. And the mega cities become very heavy smog. Here is the mega cities. You can see that mega cities are most of these are worldwide mega cities, uh, not good for human beings, livelihoods. So the same. So we are trying to uh, here also the pictures shows that one third of Chinese terror now uh, covered by the pollution. So it, most most of these uh, cities in China now is a uh, very serious pollution. So 
when you give me meditation, I think that okay. Fortunately, I can avoid the Beijing uh, pollution. So <laughs> here is really good. You have a very good environment. Now let me turn to my uh, network. We have started our environment protection, organic production, and the social network, whatever social construction. That is, I said, it's a social innovation. Uh, it's uh, 13 years ago, since the year 2001. That is, uh, uh, the, the, the local villagers mobilized by our volunteers to set up the co-op. That is, uh, I, our young volunteers from university. You have a university student society, we also. We set up more than 200 student society, sent them to the countryside to help the marginalized rural people organize. And then they said self-organization, self-empowerment, and self-development. And the Lisa, the, the people built up their own co-op uh, meeting hall for the uh, uh, development of their uh, uh, cooperatives. And uh, here that we are trying to set up the eco house, an ecological architecture means uh, recycled uh, architecture materials, no cemental. Uh, uh, so we, we don't want to have a more uh, uh, cemental materials uh, pollution. So here that is where we are trying to bridge the citizens and the rural people and for the integration. And we initiate several different programs to help the citizens to participate the uh, uh, organic production in the suburban area. So not only we set up the organizations in the countryside, we also try to have the consumers company in the urban area and then bridge them together and then to have a kind of integration. So nowadays, the central governments more emphasize the townization. Even they said, okay, urbanization is a trend, but in China, we should separate the risk into the small towns under the county level. So it means that they don't need to concentrate all the capital in these mega cities and then to have big pollution. Because, you know, China have uh, more than 3,000 county central town and then 34,000 construction town. So if we can have a kind of townization investments, okay, good. We may separate, not concentrate the pollution and the economic risk into the cities. So that is why we have so many local programs. Here is a CSA. And 10 years ago, I'm here to learn CSA in the United States. And also we are trying to learn something as a transition town in European countries. And then when we came back, we are trying to move these models in China. So we mobilized citizens to join our CSA farm, that is a community support agriculture. And then by that, we are trying to regenerate the organic production. That is a, a lot of case. They joined the farm and then to meet the animal and then to practice uh, what is the, the organic farming. And also there's young Chinese. The, the, the people, they organize the team, come to the CSA farm to, learning, uh, to, to, to learn how to regenerate the traditional agriculture. Here is our publications. And uh, we are trying to have a kind of harmonious society by people participatory agricultural actions. And now we organize many local program and then also trying to give the suggestions to the policy makers. The new, new one is that love your hometown. We are trying to organize these musicians uh, poised and uh, rap, uh, novel writers, we are trying to organize these intellectuals going to their home country, to their home village, and make them to have a memory. Don't forget where you come from. So that is a, a kind of cultural regeneration, means agriculture regeneration. So by such kind of social actions, maybe we can uh, have a, 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 a future. But if we just go to industrialization, urbanization, modernization, whatever, these decisions, 
that will be a big disaster. I, I hope that we can continue our efforts and then to have a more good future. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. It's my honor to speak here. To some Chinese, uh, to many Chinese, uh, University of Oregon is famous for warning. But to some of Chinese, University of Oregon is famous for having Professor John Foster. Yeah. I can uh, guarantee when you go to China, if you mention the, his big name, you can get a free lunch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tonight, uh, I will here, I want to express my deep thanks to uh, Law School and the uh, University of uh, Oregon for organizing such kind of wonderful event. You, the student, uh, everybody who work for this conference have our admiration. We come here, want to learn more from you, yeah. Come, somebody come here, help me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, because I work on the postmodern, I'm not good at the modern, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, you know, the, because the Professor Wynn just gave a wonderful talk, uh, in which he mentioned uh, the very how serious problem of China in the environmental issue. Yeah. Uh, so I want to, you know, briefly about, about that part. Is it okay? Yeah. Uh, this is my outline. Yeah. You know, the China right now really have a really serious problem. Yeah. So we want to take uh, you know the, a couple picture. This take a picture taken south part of China. This is from north part uh, north part of China. The last one is the north part. This is from south part. Yeah. Uh, anybody can tell me where this one take place? Tian Square. Yeah. Here they have a more clear picture. Because a lot of people come to every day, go to Tiananmen Square to sightseeing, yeah, or worship Mao, so that's it, that's the picture, yeah. Another, this is, uh, we were told that the whole Beijing already surrounded uh, by garbage, yeah. yeah. The question is, uh, what causes this problem? You know, of course, there are many reasons that can explain why it happened. One very popular explanation is that uh, because of the system. China is not a democratic system. So that's why we have the such kind of problem. There's some truth on this opinion, but we do not buy it. Because uh, let's uh, take the example of uh, the Indian. India is uh, one of the largest uh, Democracy in the in the world, but the India have the same problem. Yeah. So the recently there is a article published in the New York Times talk about the pollution in India is more serious than in Beijing, but in India nobody care about it, nobody report it. Yeah, so that's the problem. Uh, that's the the water, you know, the pollution. Can you, can you see the, the boy there? Yeah. Yeah. So the people probably will see, you know, another reason is that China no environmental law. It's not true. Actually, the, in the past 30 years, China issue a lot a lot of uh, political environmental law. Some of them even more rejected 
than the U.S. Yeah. But why you have so many uh, environmental law? The studio have so many problems. So many problem. Yeah. So it's the why the uh, environmental law didn't work well. This is I call the uh, predicament of a uh, legislation. Yeah. Why this happened? Yeah. So this is the some people think uh, probably the the system is not perfect. Yeah. This is some value there, but uh, we we have other reason want to explain. Yeah. This is the from our point of view. Some other important factors that are also responsible for China's serious ecological crisis. Here, at least three. Yeah, one is the the resistance from the capital, yeah, and from the interest group. The second, the worship of growth of development, like the Professor Wen mentioned, the developer developmentism, The third one is the human centrism, world rule, and the values. First, the resistance from interest groups. Yeah. As you know, the, that uh, includes uh, refer to both uh, uh, company, international company, multi-international company, and domestic company, and the local government. We treat them both of them as the uh, interest group. Yeah. So recently, the Chinese, uh, we have uh, Recently, the, there is the top uh, 18 multi-international company in China uh, got punished because uh, they threw a lot of garbage, but they didn't report. So that's it. A lot of Chinese people wonder, those company, they, are behavior, they behave very well in their motherland. They are responsible company. But why they in, why they are in China? They did the bad thing, so bad thing. People wonder, yeah. So it's uh, I think probably the the interest um, pushed them there, yeah. The the um, about the the local government, the you know they welcome the com they welcome the company investment, welcome the capital to the area. They don't care the the environment. That's the why I, I treat them as the same. Group, yeah, the interested group. Uh, the second uh, reason is the, the worship of uh, economic growth and development. Uh, you know the, um, the in the whole past the thirty years, uh, uh, economic growth is the, the main goal or the primary goal for whole of China. That's a, on the one hand, that explains why China grew so fast. On the other hand. Has caused a lot of problem right now. The huge price we are paying. The third one is the the anthropocentric worldview and the values. Yeah. So is the you know the from our point of view, you know, no matter uh, socialism, capitalism, both of them share the same worldview. We call the modern modernity. Influence the modern modernity, the whole of China, almost whole of China, already received the the human central world view. Yeah, that which treat the human human being as the center, where the nature just something should be be used, controlled, uh, exploited. Yeah, that's kind of those values. Yeah. So the uh, you can see that we have very famous popular song. Uh, about the you know how to control the nature, control nature, yeah, and the that's it. The from the government official to lay people, almost everybody thinks this way, yeah. Um, another you can see, I can show you the influence of such kind of a world view. It's the the purpose of Chinese environmental protection law. The 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 purpose is to safeguard. The human health and the development, still development. Yeah, so you can see the how deep the influence there. Yeah. Our our answer from our point of view, environmental issue are not only legal issue but also political issue. 
social issue and a philosophical issue uh, as well. Yeah. So it's the, that's why we think uh, in this respect, uh, both ecological Marxism and the constructed postmodernism have the potential to contribute to creating an ecological civilization in general and to improve Chinese environmental protection in particular. But what is the ecological Marxism? Probably we better ask Professor John Foster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From now on, I call the EEM. Yeah, you gotta save some time. It's hard, probably, to find a unifying definition. Yeah, we just found almost all the uh, ec ecological Marxism, Marxists, they take the similar stance. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, the, I think. Uh, they try to protect, uh, protect uh, our nature. Yeah. Uh, for them, you know, nature is not a, a commodity. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I put some picture of the, the leading figure of uh, ecological Marxism. Yeah. It's uh, the one, this one is our hero. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, he, Always look young, yeah. <laughs> In China, we call the call these people like him, like a baby face. Yeah. Uh, there's the four main theoretical stages or four, four forms. Yeah. So it's the if are interesting, you can you know read a lot of books about uh, those movement. Yeah. So it's the uh, here I want to talk some. Fact, fact, factor happening in China. Yeah, the original, or the origins and the rule of ecological Marxism and its influence in China. Yeah. So, it's, uh, right now, almost the all the important uh, uh, book by ecological Marxists already published in China. Yeah, and also there are a lot of uh, an article uh, write by Chinese uh, published in China, so the people can see this. Uh, you know, yeah, this uh, uh, paradigm. Oh, uh, the so the this is the among the nine books, the two of them just focus on John Foster's uh, ecological Marxism. Yeah, and then the, the also you know I check found in the just the last one year we found a lot of articles. There's a, here's a, some some of them uh, you can see uh, published different uh, journals, yeah, media, yeah, and the. For some uh, Chinese uh, Marxist, ecological Marxism is the most uh, creative aspect of American Marxist philosophy. Yeah. So it's the, uh, of course, ecological Marxism also received some criticism in China. Yeah. So even uh, it received a lot of uh, applause. Yeah. It's the, the one uh, major uh, uh, charge is that uh, you said uh, Capitalism is the only reason why the which caused the ecological crisis. The problem, the the point is that why ecological crisis opened also happened in China, such kind of a socialist country. Yeah, I think even the in former Soviet Soviet Union also have the same problem. Yeah. And also, the Chinese uh, ecological Marxist Marxism received uh, another char charge is that uh, the lack of the uh, social consciousness of a critic. Yeah. Uh, uh, for example, there were a big uh, company called uh, uh, Foxconn. Then uh, they have one million, more than one million employees in China. Yeah. So recently, there are the seven, 17 uh, employees jumped commit suicide. Yeah. So the such kind of, uh, you know, that company is very, very, this company is very big, but uh, they are very mean to people. Yeah. You know, they training the, you know, they, they treat the workers uh, like a machine. Yes. Yeah. So it's a part of that's explain why so many people commit suicide. Yeah. So it's, uh, but, uh, but, uh, you know, where field Chinese uh, ecological Marxists uh, criticize uh, 
such kind of uh, phenomena. Yeah, so that's why. And, um, another uh, question, uh, topic I want to talk about the CP in China. We call the constructed postmodernism in China. Yeah. So this is the, you know, in the West, the when people talk about the postmodernism, most people think about the deconstructed postmodernism. That's a French school, right? Like a Florida, like a Derrida, Foucault, yeah, a Lyotard. But in, in China, uh, we use the constructed postmodernism, which is different from deconstruction. Yeah. Because uh, China, after so many political movements, we already deconstruct too much. It's time to build something. Yeah. That's why we like this uh, phrase. This doesn't mean China should go back. Nobody wants to go back. But if everybody go to modern, go to modernization, everybody here will know it will be a disaster. Like Professor Wen just mentioned, the party we need a five Earth, right? Yeah. If there's a third way, people can live more happier. Yeah, that's the way we call the constructive postmodern, which combine the good side of a tradition and the good side of a modern and, uh, and move on. Uh, I think that is a, a very comprehensive move. Yeah. This is the three of the leading person. Why do you know the Whitehead? Yeah. This is the, who is the teacher of uh, uh, Robert Russell. Yeah. Uh, he used, uh, and the, this John Cobb is our guru, a mentor. Uh, David Griffin. Yeah. So before 1995, in China, the only one constructed post uh, the, the only one postmodernism is uh, deconstructed postmodernism. Nobody know what it mean by constructed postmodernism. But uh, 1995, the book Reenchantment of Science by David Griffin come out. Uh, I'm a very smart guy. <laughs> I give this book uh, because even in English dictionary, nobody know what it mean. Reenchantment. I can bet you can You couldn't find it e e even in Weber Dictionary. Reenchantment. Yeah. You can understand why the Chinese cannot understand. But uh, the, the smart people like me give a new name. I call it postmodern science. Yeah. <laughs> so this book becomes the very pop bestseller book in China. Yeah. <laughs> it's the whole Xian Dai Yeah. Something beyond the modern. Yeah. So right now, 80 years past, today, CP has become a quite influential movement in China. Yeah. So it's the, even a lot of Marxist government have to acknowledge it's become an unavoidable factor. Yeah. So it's, uh, so the 2013, so the they, they, they have a survey about uh, which one is the most valuable uh, theoretical point of view yeah, in 2012. So this kind of uh, opinion uh, was uh, uh, selected as the, the, the most valuable theoretical point of view. Yeah. Uh, Professor Tang is a top uh, Chinese philosopher. Uh, so he's a uh, 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 professor of Peking University. Yeah. Uh, so the first is the Make, make us feel good, right? Yeah. Also, the, from the publication, you can see, actually, the, if we back to uh, 1920, we or China already started the process out. But until uh, you can see from the 1920 to uh, 2010, yeah, so uh, there is a the, the big publication about the uh, contact postmodernism. Even just the, in the one year, you can see we found the uh, uh, 196 article. Yeah, when you check, if you can see clearly, the the topic uh, is very very diverse. It's very very diverse uh, from the you know uh, philosophy, education, uh, environmental issue, uh, even uh, to the we call the population control. Yeah, it's uh, very very diverse. People try to use this idea. 
to everywhere in the society. Yeah. Uh, besides the theory, we also also have uh, twenty five research research centers in China. Yeah. That's why I can see very very responsibly can see. I can guarantee you will got a, a free lunch in China if you mention the John Foster's name and my name. <laughs> So, yeah, this is the, the center, a uh, new center uh, in HIT, the center in Nanking. Yeah, this is Daryl Griffin. Yeah. This is the, the center last year we, we opened, yeah, in Guangzhou. Yeah, this is the. Hmm. Uh, of course, like uh, ecological Marxism, uh, constructive postmodernism also received uh, uh, criticism from the, in China. Why if one of the major charge is that uh, China, according to Marxism, you know, the history should develop uh, step by step, right? We should, uh, we should realize the modernization first, then we go to the postmodern, right? We should, uh, that means also we should uh, pollution first, we clean later, go to ecological. So that's why people think uh, the history, thinking the, we call it linear thinking, or linear, linear thinking, yeah. That's what they think uh, we are uh, too uh, idealistic, yeah, not realistic. Yeah. Uh, because uh, so many reasons outside of law, we think uh, uh, both uh, constructive postmodernism and ecological Marxism should work together. Uh, because uh, it's not a, uh, Something wrong with the system, also something wrong with the people's world will. Yeah, so that's why, or even including the development model, that's why we should work together. Yeah. Mm. So the but the question is what uh, ecological Marxism can contribute to the ecological civilization. Yeah, and here I li list the three. Yeah, three points. Mm. The first one is uh, I think the. Ecological, you know, Marx is the famous for uh, criticizing the capital or capitalism. Yeah. So I think the ecological Marxism can help us, uh, you know, uh, realize the negative side part of uh, capital. Uh, because you know, in China, in the past thirty years, uh, people, lots of people praise capital. Capital can bring, yeah, people, even the local government, they welcome the capital because. Uh, can have uh, make more people have a job, something like that. Yeah, so this is the people ignore, maybe consciously and uh, unconsciously ignore the negative side of capital. I think that like uh, Professor uh, John Foster write a lot of article book, uh, criticize the capitalism, uh, capital. I think that can help us to realize the 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 neg negative negative uh, positive uh, negative side of capital. And the I think the the pseudo conference is the first conference published uh, in China. We just uh, focus on the critic of capital. Uh, thanks uh, John Foster and uh, uh, Michael Powerman joined this conference. Yeah, I see the this conference uh, produced a very good influence. Yeah, this is the the this is the Parliament. Yeah, and here is the John. So after the conference, John gave a, a serious lecture in China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he probably, I think, uh, he's uh, struggling in the uh, f from suffering from jet lag. I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, not his fault. Yeah, uh, yeah. People know him. Yeah, yeah. Also, the last year we have a conference in China about the. Constructive postmodernism and uh, uh, ecological Marxism. Yeah, I think that there are lots of things we can work together. Yeah. Another uh, point I want to uh, emphasize is the socialism have a great potential uh, to uh, transcend the, the capital logic. Yeah, I think that because you know um, the mission of the Communist Party is to serve people, right? Yeah. I think that that's right now, the ecological, ecological right become the biggest right. Yeah. So I think that is very important, uh, you know, to defend the people's, uh, protect the people's right. Yeah. So I think the 
Communist Party should take responsibility. Yeah. And also the ecological Marxism emphasizes the social justice can help China to pursue ecological justice. Traditionally, Marxism emphasizes the social justice. Right now, the ecological issue really, really become very serious issue. Issue. So I think the ecological justice become very, very important. Yeah, should the Marxism uh, uh, should take care of this important issue. Yeah. But in China, people the in the ecological injustice uh, rep represent in you know people think uh, the company, uh, the capital, uh, the ca uh, company, they make the money, and the uh, the people, the farmers, they they suffer because of the pollu pollution, and the government they pay the price. So that's the I think the only the capital is the winner. Yeah, so that's not good. And the third point is the ecological Marxism can challenge the Chinese party to case to take its ecological responsibility more consciously. Maybe there. Maybe you think uh, uh, it's uh, ridiculous, but uh, if you think uh, China, the Communist Party. Anybody can tell me how many members we have? 80 million. 80 million, 80 zero million. Yeah. So it's the 80 million members. You can see this is the big large group. Consider their family members, their relatives, the cousins, the cousins, cousins. Yeah, there's a bigger, uh, the important force. I think uh, if they take some action, responsibility, we have big hope there. Yeah. So the, yeah. So I think uh, actually the in some sense uh, uh, China is the government party. It really you know, uh, really really take action. For example, in the uh, green energy, right now the uh, China really take the lead in this uh, field. Yeah, like this is the Dezhou Solar City. So far, this is the largest uh, you know solar city in the whole world. Yeah, whole world. And the, so the, another point later I will mention more. Another point is the water contribution. CP can contribute. I think the first CP can help Chinese people rethink modernization and development. You know, realize, realize, realizing modernization is a dream for Chinese, Chinese people for one century, yeah. So that's why you know the everybody in China, from top leader to common people, they want to become modern, yeah. Because that's the dream, yeah. This is the, but uh, we know there's a negative consequence or dark side of modernization, yeah. So that's the why the constructive postmodernism can help Chinese people to realize the negative side of modernization. In this way, China can avoid the detour of the mistake the West made, right? No need to pollution first, clean later. Probably that would be too late, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so the, some people treat uh, constructive postmodernism is uh, and not only the most uh, dynamic, uh, creative philosophy, but also uh, the new guidance theory to the modernization, yeah. It's the, it's the we have got a Marxist, the uh, Professor O, O Yang, yeah. The second is the constructive postmodernism can provide a philosophical foundation for ecological civilization, in general, for environmental law in particular, yeah. As I just mentioned, when you check the purpose of environmental law in China, you can you will you can you can find. The, the purpose still want to, uh, you know, uh, want to serve the benefit of the people first, right? Yeah, to put the human interest in the you know, priority. So that's kind of uh, uh, human centralism still dominant, dominant in the environment, environmental law. That means the, the modern world will still very influential. That's, I think, in this sense, uh, uh, constructive postmodernism 
can help us, uh, you know, to transcend uh, such kind of uh, human centralistic uh, worldview and values. Yeah. So this is the this is the we got a female author. Yeah. Is the according to her, construct postmodernism is the philosophical foundation of ec ecological literature. Yeah. It's the yeah, we got the uh, we got the uh, postmodern general. Yeah. 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 Uh according to him, construct postmodernism is a new attitude toward the relationship between humans and nature, individuals and society, individuals and the individual. Yeah. Third, construct postmodernism can help Chinese people revalue their own the tradition tradition, especially their own the traditional ecological wisdom. This is a very, very important, uh, important point. Because as you know, in the past one century, the, the, the whole of China, because we want to go to modern, we have to cut off our connection with tradition. So we, we call it the first enlightenment, as we learned from the European enlightenment. We throw away our own tradition. We treat our tradition as trash. That's why that's the slogan very it's very famous. It's called the uh, down with Confucianism, right? Yeah. But uh, if you want to throw away hollow all away your tradition, where you can stand? Where is the root? That's why our modern people we come we call we become rootless people. Our culture become rootless rootless uh, culture. What we know only consume consuming, right? Yeah, we could become a consuming machine. We, we lost our soul, our land, yeah. our root. Uh, but the CP, you know, the emphasized uh, in challenge, challenge us to uh, revalue or uh, uh, cherish our tradition. That's why it's re well received in China. Yeah. Uh, last year, we got a, a professor, uh, Professor Wen, also joined our seventh forum on ecological civilization. There's a professor over 70 come from China. Uh, when he when he hears there's an American lady and uh, her partner uh, plant Chinese herb in the U.S., so he bow to the American lady. Yeah. So the you know the our the effort the in order to promote construct postmodernism, our institute we call it IPDC and the China Project of CPS have organized a 70 conference on constructive postmodernism, process South ecological physician, both in the US and China, we, including the seven ecological forums on ecological civilization. We also training government official within scholar program. We also arranged the uh, more than 300 lecture. If anybody wants to talk to China, let me know. Yeah, this is Dr. Cobb, our mentor. Right now, he's already uh, uh, 89 years old, but he still travel. This is uh, the last year, he, last ju July, he went to China, went to the f meet the government leader. Yeah, yeah and uh, he also the uh, co-author uh, of the book, uh, For the Common Good, a co-author with uh, Herman Daly. The famous uh, ecolog uh, ecological economist, yeah. Mm. And the and the, that's why we train the government official. They come to Claremont, yeah. And also the, the pseudo conference about the sustainable urbanization. This is a pseudo mayor, yeah. And also we have the conference, yeah. This uh, work together with the Hunan government official. Yeah. Also this work the Hainan uh, government official. This is the, uh, the Claremont Forum on Ecological Civilization. Yeah. This is the last year. Yeah. This is the, the lecture I mentioned, uh, you know, we are, because we trust the, the people to people. Yeah, this communication. So every time the, when the, uh, the non-Chinese speakers talk in China, it's always a touch people because the people trust each other. They think, uh, you know, that's it, very have good uh, communication. Yeah. We especially can influence the, the young generation. Yeah. Because, of the, for example, influenced by the Hollywood, 
A lot of Chinese young generation think, okay, American people, or Western people, everybody, you know, everybody is a, is a, is a consumer, like an addiction, addiction, like a workaholic, consume, consumption, holic, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Some people want to shopping, shopping, yeah. Uh, you know, everybody, you know, just leave a big house, big car. But when they, uh, when they talk to the people, the people, they realize a lot of American people, Western people, they go to, they go green in their daily life, yeah. Like uh, Dr. Cobb, in the past 24 years, he never buy new, any new clothes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think those kind of event already produce some influence. This is from the Vice Minister of Pan Yue. Yeah, Professor Wen know him very well. Yeah, he said the uh, ecological civilization. You know, this idea come from the combination, a uh, uh, critical observation of uh, environmentalist, eco ethics, and the postmodernism. Yeah, and also the about the convergence between ecological Marxism and the construct postmodernism. Yeah. You know, because of the time limited. I cannot read all of them, but people can take a look. Yeah, you can see we share lots of things in common. Yeah, especially we think things. Uh, not not every nobody not think, not, nobody is island. Everything is integrated, so we should uh, work together, right? Yeah. So right now, because of the our effort, uh, Professor Wins, his team effort, I both effort. Right now, China, the whole of China, already reached the cons consensus on a classification. From government level, 2000, uh, 2007, and the, they publicly announced that China should uh, uh, build an ecological civilization. That is a big change. It's a big change. It's, uh, it's the last uh, two years ago, it's the 18th Congress. They already write ecological civilization into part of the Constitution. That is uh, probably among the whole world, probably only Chinese party. Uh, did that, yeah. Uh, China only talk a, a good game or do it seriously. Yeah. I think the from my point of view, it, it's seriously. Yeah. I show some you know, show, show you some evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Also recently, the Xinhua News report, report tell us 20, 20, 22 Chinese provinces have had reduced their GDP target. That's a very big change. Uh, in the individuals, people also go green, yeah. Because uh, uh, before people think oh, we're waiting for, we should be waiting for the government. There is their business. But right now, people realize everybody, uh, everybody has resp responsibility. We can also can do something, yeah. So I will show you some picture. This is the one, the Ningbo protester, yeah. So the there's the company, you know, set up a chemical plant there. So eventually. The protester win, yeah, yeah. So, so is the Sherry Liao also is our eco hero, yeah. Uh, she helped build a uh, uh, ninety uh, eco villages, yeah. The Professor Wen is also our eco hero. Yeah. This is more handsome than that one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the Professor Zhong Chao Liu who uh, making the, we call a, a ecological fertilizer. I brought a tea for Professor Foster made by that kind of uh, ecological foster, yeah. uh, fertilizer. Yeah. This is the uh, Professor He uh, was a student of uh, Professor Wen. Yeah. She helped uh, sell organic uh, rice for farmers. So even the uh, pres uh, president Xi want to learn something from her. Yeah. This is one I want to emphasize. He is a farmer. Farmer. Uh, then the he planned uh, forty Chinese mu, but uh, he consciously left uh, five mu for bird. Plant the uh, food for the bird. Why? Because after the bird. Eat the food, the bird think uh, I should do something for this guy. <laughs> so the bird help him eat the worm. So in his uh, land, fish farm, no need the, uh, any the, uh, uh, 
call it the yeah, parasite, yeah, something like that, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is the, our lawyer in China, the very famous lawyer, yeah. Uh, the, he used to sue the bigger company, yeah, on behalf of the animals' right, yeah. yeah. And this is a photographer, and the picture I, I told you before about the garbage of Beijing took it by him. The, the, and then the, after uh, his exhibition, the Beijing government uh, take a, uh, um, called a hundred million to deal with the garbage. So that's in one person can make a big difference. Yeah, this is the the probably Chinese people. Everybody know him. He's the number one CCTV host. His name is Cui. Yeah, he's the anti-GMO hero in China. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, recently, he used his own money come to U.S. Uh, to do the investigation. Yeah, because uh, right now in China, the major media, media, even the science, uh, they always everybody say uh, GMO is good. Every American people they eat GMO food. So the professor, the three, Mr. Three, want to come to U.S. Uh, want to show people the evidence. You know, want to do the investigation. Another one is, uh, I want to mention, the, you know, this last one, not the, not the unimportant one, it's very, very important. She's really a farmer. Yeah. So I think the, in the beginning, she sell the for chemical fertilizer. Then she found it's not the right way. Then she want to uh, go to the ecological, but uh, he found the problem because right now China become, um, see, village become empty. How to organize the farmers, make people work together? That's uh, her. in the beginning, she teacher ask the uh, teacher the farmers let let's the female farmers uh, uh, um, villagers dance. They the women say, oh no no we don't dance. Uh, only the bad people dance. Only only the city people dance. We are villagers, we don't dance. But uh, the Mr. Zheng said, who said only bad people village, uh, the city people dance? After discussion, yeah, they decided uh, you know. Yeah, okay, yes, we, we can dance. After dance, you know, they feel good. Then she organize the people clean the environment on the village. In the beginning, people say, okay, this government uh, responds not to earth. This the discussion, then it's okay. Or we also can do something. Then they clean their village. Then right now, I think uh, her club, uh, the community, already have uh, more than 3,000 members join their group. Yeah. I think that's a very good one. So another important thing I want to mention is that their community already attract the young graduates after graduate from the city back to village. That's very important. Yeah, that's found the root in the village. Yeah, and the first one also is that right now a lot of individual they take action. For example, the in China right now the mainstream the typical way when they have wedding. That's the hair, you know, hair, the lemon tea. Very wrong, you know, a lot of very, very big waste. But uh, this uh, uh, girl and the boys, uh, when they married, they decided, okay, we use the color bicycle wedding. So the, and the 200 volunteers joined the wedding. So I think later, we hope uh, they have a, a constructed postmodern baby. That's our hope. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's uh, work together for ecological civilization together. Yeah, I think the there is the Chinese saying, you know, the, if everybody has more wood, we can have a big fair. The English we said uh, many people make work light. So let's work together. Thank you. I, I wanted to reiterate that um, when, when I was talking to Professor Wen and Professor Wong earlier today, they said that coming here and being with us at this conference gave them hope. And, um, and I thought that was very important because I think they've, they've given us hope. That I don't think that you can look at China the same way again.
uh, we're, you know, we're a world movement and we're going to become more that way. I wanted to, to um, ask the other visitors from China because there, there are a whole group of visitors from China. I wanted to ask them to stand up as, as well if, if they could and we could give them applause. All, all of them. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm not sure what I do now. <laughs> Where's the boss? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. We're going to take about two minutes before we get started with the next keynote, okay?
All right, everyone, we're going to get started here with the next keynote. So if everybody wants to take their seats, we'll get started in about a minute. Hello. Hi, my name is Sam, and I'm here to introduce one of the bravest individuals that I've ever met, Lear Keith. First of all, uh, Lear is the author of six books, including The Vegetarian Myth, Food Justice, and Sustainability, which has been called the most important ecological book of this generation. She's also the co-author of a strategy manual entitled Deep Green Resistance, which actually puts forward a strategy that could pose a real threat to the industrial systems which are destroying life on this planet. Lear has been arrested six times for acts of political resistance, and she continues to be one of the only public figures who is naming industrial civilization as the root problem of the environmental issues that we face, and actually advocating for decisive action against it. So, in other words, Lear has made it her life work to advocate for strategy that actually works. And for those of us who aim to win, we know how important a working strategy actually is. And in doing this work, Lear has inspired thousands, including me, to take on the struggle alongside of her. And I'm sure that many of the people in this room feel the same way. <laughs> But I'd like to acknowledge that it's no secret that Lear's work has stirred up a lot of controversy, and loudly so. But a friend of mine once said that if you're ever trying to find where the real work is happening, then you should first look out for the fireworks. And Lear has brought fireworks to this city, but true to form, through all of the noise, she hasn't lost sight of the very difficult task ahead. So without further ado, here she is. So right now, um, scientists are debating whether a quarter, a third, or fully half of all mammals will be extinct by the year 2050. Some of them are debating whether the planet will support life at all by the end of this century. What's not up for debate, not ever, is a culture that devours with an entitlement so profound it is turning the planet to dust. That dust is not hyperbole. The dust storms in China, the inevitable endpoint of agriculture, the dust storms are so bad, they're triggering asthma in children in Colorado. So here's the dust, it's leaving China, and here it is landing in Aspen. I know it's unbearable. Reality is an avalanche of grief right now. But I'm asking each of you to take your heart out of cold storage. You put it there for safekeeping, I know. But there is no safety on a planet being murdered. In French, the word for heart, that's the root of our word for courage. To face the facts, we will need our hearts. And to face down power, which is what everyone in this room is proposing and a modest proposal it is not. Uh, we will need all the courage of which our hearts are capable because that power is huge. It's a vast and global system that has gone rabid with destruction and it's called civilization. Now that word civilization, that just means people living in cities. What that actually means is that they need more than the land can give. So food, water, energy, they have to come from somewhere else. From that point forward, it doesn't matter 
what lovely, beautiful, peaceful values people might hold in their hearts. That society is dependent on imperialism and genocide because no one willingly gives up their land, their water, their trees. But since the city has used up its own, it has to go out and get those from somewhere else. And that's the last 10,000 years in a few sentences. Okay, the central concept here is drawdown. If you use more wood than a forest can grow, eventually the forest will be gone. If you take fish faster than they can spawn, the day will come when that river is nothing but water and sorrow. And then there are things that don't reproduce, things like oil, things like coal. Using them at all means using them up. It can only be drawdown. Now you can blow up mountains to get to the last of it, um, but now you're drawing down mountains as well as coal, and at the end of the day, it's still gone. Okay, this isn't a differential equation. Um, it's not even algebra. It's basic arithmetic. If you have one planet, one cradle of air, one blanket of soil, right? One place you call home, and you destroy it, it's one minus one. Our planet needs us to do the math. No one seems willing. I mean, they could put a man on the moon, they can't do one minus one. And our planet needs us to be, in the words of the inimitable James Howard Kunstler, reality-based adults. That one minus one isn't a surprise. It didn't sneak up on us. Um, it's been going on for 10,000 years. In fact, it's the longest war ever. It's the pattern of civilization over and over and over. There's a bloated power center um, surrounded by conquered colonies from which that center extracts what it wants and then it collapses. Um, and that collapse takes between 800 and 2,000 years. It lasts until the soil gives out. Because the primary activity of civilization is agriculture. So you have to understand what agriculture is. In very brute terms, you take a piece of land, you clear every living thing off it, and I mean down to the bacteria, and then you plant it to human use. So it's biotic cleansing. It's also not a plan with the future because it's drawdown. And one of the main things you're drawing down is fossil soil. To give you a number, one season of planting your basic row crop, so corn or soy or wheat, you can destroy 2,000 years of soil. Make no mistake, the planet has been skinned alive, and what should be habitat for millions of creatures turns to salt and dust. So this is Iraq. It's one of the places where agriculture started. No one in their right mind would call this place the Fertile Crescent now. This is Iran, so 90%, 94% of the ag land is degraded. In the background, that's not a mountain range. That's soil that's been turned to dust. Pakistan, one-third. 150 years ago, this was a teak forest. And here's poor China again. This is inevitable, okay? This isn't agriculture on a bad day. This isn't agriculture done poorly. It's what agriculture is. You pull down the forest, you rip up the prairie, you drain the wetland, you exsanguinate the world of water and soil and species, and the process of life itself. Now, a lot of people get very confused here. It's not our fault. Um, this is a profound cultural ignorance about the material base of our culture, okay, about what agriculture is. So I want to walk you through this um, because I want you to hate me. <laughs> okay, that was a joke. <laughs> My only joke. Uh, yeah, I actually don't care whether you hate me. That's not the point. The point is I want the people who care the most about this planet to actually understand the depth of the problem because we will never uh, come up with solutions if we don't understand the scale of this. That's what I want. Okay, so I'm gonna bring this home. Think about what's outside your kitchen window. Now, most likely you have a couple of trees or you have a little patch of lawn. You have either a mini forest or a micro prairie. Now, let's say you wanna grow some corn or some lettuce. You can't just throw those seeds around and hope for the best. Corn and lettuce are never going to outcompete trees and grass, okay? That's never. 
um, you already know what you have to do. If you want corn or lettuce, you have to chop down the tree, you gotta dig up the lawn, right? You pull down the forest, you plow up the prairie. You have to destroy that biotic community. When I was 20, I had a biology professor who told me the truth in one sentence. The moment you put a pile to soil, you destroy that soil. In that sentence, I watched it all collapse. All these people need to be fed. The only way to feed them is to do agriculture, to take more and more land. But agriculture is the destruction of that land. So every day, we are digging a deeper grave. I saw it, but I couldn't follow it to the end. It was too horrible. So I ran. I ran from that knowledge. But it followed me, like any good truth. It wouldn't let me go. That was the angel I wrestled for 20 years. And there was only the grimmest of blessings to be won. This is not a liberatory truth. It is not a celebratory truth. It's like a wound that can corrode the soul. You all know what I'm talking about. There were whales once in the Mediterranean. There were elephants in China. There were so many bison on the Great Plains, you could sit on a
independence movement, which was the land war. So very successful use of nonviolent resistance. Um, this was a struggle to get the land actually back into the hands of the people who actually lived there. Um, and this was the beginning of, of the movement for independence. Um, okay, so another example, Harlem Renaissance. You've got the exact same pattern. Um, a redefinition of what it means to be black. The black experience is centered in the, in the Harlem Renaissance. So the music, the poetry, um, you know, the, the literature, all of this is um, you know, completely recentering what it means to be black in the United States. And within a generation, you get the Civil Rights Movement. If you don't know who this is, this is little Ruby Bridges, and she pretty much single-handedly desegregated the Louisiana public school system. And I love this picture because I'm sure like many of you, you hear all the time, we can do nothing. It is too late. It is too big. Nothing we do is going to work. And it's, you know, the rending of clothes and the wailing and the pulling of hair and complete despair about how bad things are, and I get that. But I see this picture, and I think we have no right to this kind of despair when a six-year-old child can produce this kind of courage. She wrote a great memoir, by the way, of what this experience was. Another great example. Um, this is the so-called Great Awakening or National Awakening in the Baltic countries. Um, and this leads, again, right into the Baltic independence movement. Now, it took them a little bit longer, but, you know, they had World War I, World War II, Nazis, Soviets. Eventually, yes, though. They get the independence movement. So this was 1989. Um, they made a human chain that was 600 kilometers long through all three Baltic nations. Two million people linked hands. You should know there's only eight million people in the Baltic, so 25% of the population did this. And from that point forward, independence was inevitable. So a true culture of resistance is self-consciously the cradle of the resistance movement. It believes in resistance. It encourages it, plans for it, supports it, and then prepares for its ultimate victory. And that's the difference between culture as a successful part of resistance and culture as a dead end into irrelevance and despair. So throughout history, um, you've got the culture resistance that builds the new institutions that can um, organize the new society as the old one comes down. And then you've got the combatants doing the direct confrontations with power. Now we need lots and lots of people to do the standard work that cultures of resistance do. We also need to repair the vast biotic communities that have been destroyed. This work will involve huge numbers of people in many different organizations, all of them above ground and nonviolent. So uh, local economies, participatory democracy, systems of justice, that character building, and ultimately, of course, there's direct support for the frontline actionists. But the vast majority of people aren't going to resist shit, and I think we just need to accept that. Um, of those that do, it's still only a tiny number that ever take up those frontline positions. That's actually true in regular armies. It's only about 2% that have the direct combat roles. The other 98% do support. Um, that's the ratio of combatants to support personnel, whether it's an army or a resistance movement. That 2% is about what's needed. Most people aren't going to take that up. They don't have the personality for it or they can't take the risks for really legitimate reasons. And that's fine, because the support personnel are crucial to all of this. Um, but you know, all of this, the last 30 minutes, all of this has been for you who are the 2%, because you're the people I want to talk to. We need warriors who will put themselves between what is left of this planet and fossil fuel. We need to stop industrial civilization. Now that could be done nonviolently. If we had enough people, we could shut this party down by midnight using human blockades. The problem is, I don't see the numbers, not anywhere. I would love to be wrong. I would vastly prefer to wage this struggle nonviolently, but my longing will not bring forth the necessary numbers. So given a realistic assessment of what we actually have, the only viable strategy left that I can see is direct attacks against infrastructure. In the plainest terms, we need to stop them. We need to, <laughs> oh, thank you. We need an underground organization with the training, the discipline, the command structure, and the strategic smarts to coordinate decisive action on a continental scale and we needed it yesterday. 
And it would be really great if the permaculture wing will get on board and provide that culture of resistance, especially the loyalty and the material support. At the very least, I wish people would stop saying that it can't be done. It can. The real question is, why aren't we doing it? That's not a rhetorical question. I think there are multiple answers, um, some that speak well of us and some that don't. But as people of conscience, justice is our deepest wish, right? It's our North Star. And we know it's opposite. We know what violence feels like, intimate, shattering, and permanent. We want to draw a line firmly and forever, a line that is really a protective circle between human beings in all our soft mammalian vulnerability and violence. We need that line because every single one of us should be inside that circle. I know what I'm asking, but every living creature is asking too on a scale that defies meaning. Mountains are falling. The oceans are dying. The climate itself is bleeding out, and it's your children who will see if it's beyond repair. So here is the question from what is left of this planet to us. Do we have thousands of people ready to shut down the industrial economy? Because that is what has to be done. And that's what it would take, body after body, day after day, standing between the plankton, the plovers, the mountains themselves, and the rancid sadism of power. It could be done. This is the French labor strike of 2010. Thousands of people turned out to protest austerity measures. Now, they had a different goal, but that's not my point. The point is they almost brought the economy to a halt. They blockaded fuel depots, they closed 30 oil refineries, and also the major oil terminal. The French strikes, strikers did what every military and every insurgency does. They interrupted keynotes of infrastructure. They were well on their way to shutting down the entire economy, and they did it using nonviolence. So it could be done. We could stop the industrial economy. We could stop the murder of everything if we had enough people but we don't. I don't arrive at this moment with any joy, um, but this is where history has brought me and abandoned me. No one has ever had to make decisions before about the murder of everything, about the end of life itself. I can't turn away from my moral agency to ease my moral agony. And meanwhile, we're out of time. At the very least, could we consider some strategies that might match the scale of the problem. Okay, these are written with your tax dollars, so you might as well read them. Just saying. <laughs> Direct attacks on infrastructure are highly effective. Um, the reason you can learn about asymmetric warfare at places like West Point and the US Army and training camps all over the world is because it works. The principles have been honed for decades. So, coordinated multiple attacks. Um, what you're ultimately after is called cascading systems failure. And that's how you get there, coordinated multiple attacks against nodes of infrastructure. That's exactly what the French labor strike did. They did it nonviolently because they had lots of people, but it's the same principle. And the whole endeavor depends on one thing, target selection. Okay, so four things to consider. How important is the target? How tough is the target? Can you get to the target? And what would it cost the enemy to replace that target? So now some things began to make sense. I essentially wasted my youth because I didn't know this. Um, one of the reasons that many resistance movements have no decisive success is that the targets have low criticality, high recuperability. That's very typical for resistance groups that lack training which is most of us. Targets are chosen for their accessibility, right? You can get to them. But those targets aren't in any way critical, and they're easily repaired. That would be your basic McDonald's window strategy. I say this as someone who has smashed her share of windows. Um, I destroyed thousands of dollars of property, and we were brave and committed and righteous. We were glorious with rage. It was pointless. Why? Low criticality, high recuperability. 
breaking that window doesn't stop those bad people from doing the bad things, not for a second. We have got to stop thinking like vandals and start thinking like field officers. And yes, I understand the implications of what I'm suggesting. I can insist that the distinction be between property and people is obvious and absolute, but I know what can go wrong. Even with every ethical bulwark in place against harm to sentient beings, I know what can go wrong. It's too easy for ideology to tighten into fanaticism and unmoor our basic moral precepts. And extremism has its own addictive thrills. History has a pile of bodies attesting to that. I know. But I weigh that knowledge against the Cascade Mountains wolf and the coho salmon and the longest night of extinction. I weigh that knowledge against the certainty that our one and only home, lush with life and the promise of more, will soon be a bare rock if we do nothing. And I know everyone in this room is working as hard as you can, but carbon breached 400 parts per million this year. How much time do we have left? Five generations of salmon? Three generations of plovers? One generation of humans. I think it's possible to draw a line that's absolute between people and property, between sentience and objects, and never forget. But maybe I have to believe that, because I see an emergency the size of land and sea and sky, and no other options. So I have two small offerings to my own moral grief. The main British suffrage organization, the WSPU, did you know that they took up arson? Um, tired of being tortured in prison, um, they escalated from civil disobedience. Uh, they burned down train stations, they blew up golf courses, and they set fire to historic buildings with no loss of life. They hurt no one, and they won the vote. It was called sheer madness, and it split the movement, but not a single human was hurt. In our own lifetimes, we have the Earth Liberation Front. They have waged a 30-year campaign of property destruction, some of it quite serious, um, and have never once lost their way across that line to harm a single human. So how could it be done? Well, this is MEND, the Movement for the Emancipation of the Niger Delta. Now, I want to be clear, I do not support everything these people have done. I'm not valorizing this group. But target selection toward cascading systems failure? Oh, yes, this they have done well. The Niger Delta is the world's largest wetland, only it could more reasonably, reasonably be called a sludge land now. The indigenous people are knee-deep in oil industry waste. The fish are devastated, and the people are sick and starving. There's been widespread nonviolent resistance to the oil industry, but men took up other tactics. They do direct attacks on rigs, pipelines, bridges, support facilities, and different vessels. Um, they've reduced Nigeria's oil output by a dramatic one-third, and that's permanent. In one attack, they reduced the oil by 10%, and in a series of attacks across one week, they reduced the oil by 80%. They do surprise attacks against simultaneous targets toward that goal of disrupting the entire system of production. So cascading systems failure. These people are quite serious. They have college educations. They've studied other militant movements. And they number a few hundred. Now understand, a few hundred people, well-trained and organized, have reduced the oil output of Nigeria by a third. There's at least that many people in this room, so it could be done. Hold on to that thought for as long as you can bear it. It could be done. History may have abandoned us here, but I am not abandoning my people. There are tree frogs outside my house, despite the global amphibian die-off, and every time it rains, they sing. And I hear what they're saying, that the world is green and wet and wondrous, and it's ready for more frogs. We also have a spotted owl on our land. I've heard him calling. He is pushed to the absolute edge of a refugia. There's no old growth for him, but he keeps trying. There's also a mountain lion at my front door. <laughs> um, and 
I think anyone but a male cougar knows to stay far, far away when they hear that call. She's fertile, she's female, and she's saying one thing. Life wants to live fiercely. They aren't just scenery, and they aren't my neighbors. They're my kin. Look the facts as they stand. Our planet is dying. Actually, she's being drawn and quartered. We're on the verge of complete biotic collapse. Did you know there are parts of China in which there are no longer any flowering plants? No flowering plants. That is 500 million years of evolution. It's gone. Complete biotic collapse. We need to start thinking like a serious resistance movement because this is a war. I know it feels like daily life. It's been going on for 10,000 years. The lights are on. The cupboards are full. But it's a war. And if anyone is left alive 100 years from now to look back, they are going to wonder, what the fuck was wrong with us that we didn't fight like hell when our planet was going down? Now you love something or you wouldn't be here today. Whatever you love, it is under assault. But love is a verb. We have got to let that love call us to action. Thank you. All right, everyone, thanks for coming out this evening. We'll have another round of keynote addresses tomorrow in the law school in room 175. Come see Jane Lubchenco and Professor Patrick Parentau. Thanks and have a good evening. <laughs>